Hello and welcome to the Finance Quarter, I'm Andrew Robertson. One of the pitfalls of running a small business is that you can get sidelined on paperwork and other administrative tasks. And what that means is you spend less time on the income generating functions of the business, the things you love and the reason why you started the business in the first place. It's a big issue and small business expert Julia Bickerstaff has some solutions. Julia, you started a small business and the business has become successful and is starting to grow. And it seems one of the prices you pay for that success is that you end up doing less of the things that you love that made the business a success in the first place. How does that happen? Well, often people start a business because there's something they particularly love. So somebody might start a, you know, a toy shop because they love interacting with kids and, and searching out toys for them, or they might start you know, a knitting shop because they love things to do with knitting. They start because of something that they love doing. But as the business grows, they start to have to you know, get involved in some of the admin or selling or some other part of the business. And the thing that they really love doing is often the easiest thing for them to get somebody else to do. So imagine, say, it was to do with, uh, something to do with knitting. You train other people to do the knitting, but you're busy behind the scenes worrying about the finances, worrying about you know, opening new shops, doing that sort of stuff. So you find yourself moving away from the thing that you love doing and running the business. What impact does it have on the business if the person who started the business is being pulled away from doing the things that made the business a success? Well, for some businesses, it's fine because, you know, some, some people love running the business. They actually find they've got a new passion there and it works OK. But for others, they actually start to resent the business. And if you, it's your business and you start to resent it, you don't put as much effort into it or you can, you know, customers can tell it's not as a vibrant a business. And in fact, it can actually really start to deteriorate. What are some of the things that people do when they do become disengaged that can take the edge off the business? Well, for instance, um, they might not you know, look at the finances very well for the business anymore because they actually start to think this business isn't working. And rather than look at how, how can we make it work better, what can we do uh, maybe to help cash flow, for instance, in the business, we let it become a self-fulfilling prophecy that the business isn't working. So rather than looking at alternatives to make it work, we sort of say, look, it's not working anymore. So we let it sort of drift away. Or in our interactions with customers, we're not we're not vibrant a, a, about what we're doing anymore. You know, y y you've probably been to um, a, a shop or a business where the person doesn't seem very key, doesn't, they're just not happy with their business and you just don't want to buy from them anymore. You're not engaged with that business. And so it, that sort of happens, it, it happens, it's, it can be quite a gradual thing. And in fact, the worse it gets, the more that owner has to spend behind the scenes in the business trying to fix it up. So they're spending less time doing what they wanted to do and so it continues. Does it happen with all businesses as they grow? Well, no, it doesn't happen to all businesses because some people are very good at working out what it is they like doing in a business and what they don't like doing in a business and then designing the business you know, to work for them. After all, if it's your business, you should design it to suit you. For instance, there's a guy I met years ago and he loved designing fire alarm systems and he was very, very good at it and he started a business doing that and he was engaged by you know, big corporates to design the sort of fire systems in buildings. But he actually loved the design part, but as the business got bigger, he found that he was sort of doing the admin, running the business, doing the sales, but not doing the design. And what he did, which, which was quite a brave thing to do, but he said, you know what, what I want to do is I want to design the systems. So I'm going to hire somebody to be my CEO. So I'm going to hire someone else to be my boss. I'm still going to own most of the shares in the business. I'm still going to be a director. So the CEO is going to report to me in my um, position as owning the business, but I'm going to work for him. And I'm going to let him go and find the sales. I'm going to let him run the business. I'm going to let him hire people because what I want to do is I want to go and do the designing. And that's what he did. I actually know of CEOs who run family-owned businesses who have different ideas on how the business should be run to the owner and it causes a great deal of tension. Now, how do you resolve that? Look, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. I think it takes, um, it, it takes a big, courageous person, actually, to, to say to somebody, you know, you can run the business, you know what our objectives are, and I'm going to 
you know, let, the reason I've hired you is for your skills at running this business. So I'm going to have to let you get on with it. And it's not easy, but I think it takes, um, you, you've got to respect the person that you've brought in to do the job which you've asked them to do. But as the owner, you can still help set, or you would be setting, you know, what you want from the goals of the business, sort of the values of the business, some of the... Um, the, the, the fundamental parts of the business is still yours. What they need to do is they, within that framework, are running the business for you. Julia Biggestaff, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. When small businesses become big businesses, they can struggle to stay true to their roots, the roots which helped them grow in the first place. Now, no company exemplifies that more than Billabong. It's a global, iconic brand in the young adult and youth markets closely associated with the beach culture. But its strategy has gone badly wrong, culminating in a loss this year of nearly $300 million. The reality here is that they've got to go back to what made them famous. You know, once upon a time, they, they, the mythology of, of Billabong and the surfwear industry as a whole was that they used to have management meetings on the waves at 6.30 in the morning. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. I think they've lost sight of what drives that business to make it unique and they've got to rediscover that and they've got to do it in a powerful way and they've got to do it in a fast way. Search engine Google is an important source of customers for many businesses. But social media is changing the way Google operates and if you're not aware of those changes, your business could suffer. Well, to find out what all this means, I spoke with social media commentator Laurel Papworth. Laurel, when a potential customer does a search, you want your business to come out at or near the top. How's that being threatened by social media? Social media is changing the way that we search. So now, these days, we often ask on Twitter or on Facebook and our friends if they can help us find an accountant, a financial services person or even a restaurant nearby. But the other thing now is that Google's seeing those behaviours and realising that's what we want as human beings is personal recommendations. So they're gradually changing the search engine, they're changing Google search to reflect what our friends and family are liking online. So when you say reflecting what friends and family like online, it's people we relate with, not the whole community. That's right. Google's starting to change search so that what comes to the top of search are the things that your friends and family have um, liked in some form on a social media site. Maybe they've tweeted it or maybe they've used Google Plus or they've bookmarked it in some way and shared it in some way and in some cases it looks like Google's also tracking their personal history. So if they looked at a holiday or they just Google searched and clicked on a restaurant, now it will show up in your search uh, at, towards the top. So just to take that restaurant example, uh, under the way social media is uh, impacting Google searches, if you're a person who likes $20 meals and you're searching for a restaurant, you won't now be shown restaurants that charge $50 for a meal. It, look, it does look like Google's checking your friends in what we call your social graph. So if you're a university student and all your friends are university students and they don't have a lot of money and they're all going to um, the local restaurant and they're using check-in services like Foursquare and Facebook Places and Google Places and reviewing those restaurants and basically participating with those restaurants on the restaurant's Facebook page and Google Plus page and Twitter accounts, then Google looks at your social graph at your friends. It looks at the rest restaurants that they're going to, the ones they're recommending and, uh, and checking in on, and then it's putting those restaurants first. So yeah, you're quite likely you're going to get the cheap restaurants if that's what your mates are going to. But flipping it round and looking at it from a business point of view, what are the implications for business uh, from the way social media is impacting the Google search system? I think Google search is just a part of the ongoing new social economy, which is what we call the C to C economy. It's the consumer to consumer economy or customer to customer economy. It's where when the customer purchases something, they immediately turn around and become the advertiser to their friends and family and their social network and say, hey, look what I just bought, or this is the restaurant I'm at, or here's a photo of the dinner that I'm eating. And as search becomes more and more integrated in that, it's called search plus your world, it means that if you're not participating as a business in social media, it's quite possible that either people are talking about you and you don't know it and you need to know, or they're not talking about you, in which case you don't exist. And if you don't exist, it's a very difficult position to be in if you're trying to activate a customer-to-customer -customer channel. 
So I guess one of the benefits of the way social media is impacting the Google search is that the customers that actually come through your door would actually be the customers that you're looking for. We often talk about market segmentation in marketing in Australia, but we don't actually do it very well. Our products and services should not be all things to all people. We should be very clear we're targeted to this group and they will now take our products and services and talk about them to their network. And, you know, it's not just qualified leads, but it's trusted sources. Um, I think we, we trust our mum and our best friend um, and our partner to make recommendations to us more than we have trust advertising or even celebrities that do advertising on television. It's, it's, a, it's a, trust, a truly trusted source. And another example that social media is here to stay and that business really can't ignore it. Absolutely. If you ignore social media at your own peril because for all the search engine optimization, that work you might be doing to make sure your website comes top in search, if you're ignoring social, it's going to be a big risk in the future. Laurel Papworth, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Here's a question for you. When is an airline not an airline? The answer, when it's a virtual airline. It's no secret that competition in international travel is fierce, which is why Qantas is losing so much money. But Virgin Australia is showing the way forward with its international airline that isn't. The really, really interesting contrast between Qantas International and Virgin International is that Virgin, to a very large extent, is a virtual international airline, and that really is the model that uh, a carrier in the position where we are geographically in Australia needs to be. And I think we're starting to see... Um, Qantas actually moving in that direction. I mean, if they make a deal with Emirates, that's a very large lump of, of virtual operation. If you're watching this in the southern states, you're probably mystified as to how rugby league could wangle a billion dollar television contract almost as big as the AFL's. After all, AFL is a truly national game, whereas rugby league is really only big in New South Wales and Queensland. Well, I was baffled too, until I spoke to media strategist Steve Allen. This New South Wales and Queensland markets are roughly the same amount of population that's in the, the southern states, the Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia. So the, 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 the potential for audiences are roughly equal. Yes, it is true that AFL seems to be further developed in the northern states, uh, New South Wales and Queensland, but, but that fluctuates depending on the home team's playing success. In other words, it's all in the numbers, and apparently Lee can deliver those numbers. Well, that's it for this edition of the Finance Quarter. As always, if you'd like to see any part of the program again, you can find us on the ABC News website. Just go to the business page and click on the Finance Quarter icon. We're also on Twitter at the address on your screen now. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Finance Quarter.